Welcome back. I'm Chris Gosselin and this afternoon I'm talking to Charlie Aitken from AIM Investment Management. Charlie's been around in the industry, the finance industry, for a long time and he started AIM in 2015. So to start with, I asked him how he got into the industry and how that has changed the way he looks at managing money. July 2015. Um, what were you doing before that? Because I guess that wasn't your first job straight out of university? No, my first job was uh, picking up uh, receipts on the futures floor of the Sydney Futures Exchange. It wasn't very gra glamorous, Chris. But I started right at the bottom collecting the trading receipts from the traders and that was with Ordmanet. And I, I luckily got a job as a stockbroker after that at uh, Ordmanet and things went from there. So for a long time I was a stockbroker at different stockbroking firms up until 2015 where a couple of clients asked whether I'd be prepared to look after money and that's where the idea of uh, having a fund started. And so the different sides of the sort of the buy desk and the sell desk, how different is that? Oh, look, quite frankly, it's completely different outside of the fact you're dealing in equities. Yep. You know, I think the motivations are different. Obviously, as a stockbroker, you're, you're more incentivized to you know, yeah, generate transactions and activity. Yep. Whereas on this side of the fence, when you're running money, you don't want too many transactions or activity. You just want to invest in great businesses and hold them for basically as long as you can. So different motivations, albeit you know, dealing in the same asset class. And did it take time to adjust to that or had you been sort of doing that anyway as a broker? Oh, I think it does take time to adjust. I think that, you know, it's quite a big leap from being a stockbroker strategist writing about equities to actually investing in equities. So, you know, it does take quite a big adjustment to adjust your mindset to the longer term. I mean, when, it's no offence to any stockbrokers listening to the interview, but it's, a, it's quite a... It's a short term focus being a stockbroker. You need activity and you're about the next deal, the next IPO, and it does take a little bit of time to change your mindset from that. But once you do, you, you become an investor and it's probably a better place to be. Sure. So tell me a bit about the history of AIM over that time, because you changed your strategy in 2019. What generated that change or caused that change and how have you found it since? Well, really, it was just an unacceptable return in 2018. We generated a minus 20 something percent return in 2018, which myself and my partners and my colleagues just said was unacceptable. And we looked back at what 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 did we do that uh, it, it exacerbated that problem, and we tried to take that out of the investment process. So we looked back and analysed where we went wrong. So we decided no more shorting, no more gearing, unhedge the currency, and don't invest directly in emerging markets. And that was four major decisions we took, plus we deepened the research team and brought in a, brought in a, a deeper valuation-based approach to, to investing, in terms of using DCFs, et cetera. And that's really in, in generated much better returns for us there. It's lowered the volatility of the fund and generated better returns. So it was in reaction to a year that we thought was an unacceptable return. And since then, the returns have been very acceptable. But I think in all of business and all of life, you have to make adjustments. And we didn't want to make the same mistakes twice, so we took out the elements that we thought exacerbated our problems in that calendar year. And that's a brave thing to do because you actually have to admit that you're doing things wrong and no one likes sort of admitting you're doing things wrong but it's a brave thing to do and it's proven to be a sensible, sound business decision and presumably a good decision for your investors. Yeah, it's been a good decision for the business and our investors and I think that we're very comfortable how we're running the money now. We have a very strict process, we have parameters and we do things on a very repetitive basis and it's a much better way of running money. I think if I looked back in the past, I've probably had too many moving parts, to the ability to do too much and I think that distracts you from your core strength, which is actually picking companies and sticking with them for the medium term. Businesses that can grow over the medium term and compound your, compound your capital. I mean, that's what I did best as a stockbroker strategist, picking stocks. But I think in the previous form of the fund before we made the changes, we simply had too many moving parts. And obviously, as you learn, leverage exacerbates mistakes as well. So any sure. form of gearing was unhelpful to the mistakes we made. So look, I don't mind admitting that we made mistakes, but I'm proud that we changed, that changed things and changed them quite dramatically and have stuck to that since then. And since then, the returns have been you know, what we were hoping for. That's terrific. Let's just drill down a little bit into the strategy. It's global, long only, yep. in large cap. Well, we'll go down to mid caps occasionally, but it's basically got global, concentrated, large cap equity. We generally hold between 15 and 25 stocks, generally fully invested and generally unhedged to the, to the currency. But we really focus on quality. You know, so obviously a lot of debate at the moment, value versus growth, etc. Well, we have some stocks that would qualify as value and some that would qualify as growth, but they're all super high quality. And quality we define as balance sheet, market positions, barriers to entry, management, usual things. 
but we like to invest how we invest in concentrated quality. Probably a, g- a good place to be, you know, value and growth, because there's, there, as you say, there is this argument at the moment about where you should be. So as long as the company fits, you're happy with what sector it fits in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's certain things we won't invest in because the return on invested capital is weaker than we would like to achieve inside the portfolio. So generally, we don't invest in banks, real estate investment trusts, commodity stocks, because over the long run, their return on invested capital is quite low. We generally try to look for the bigger pools of capital, bigger pools of profit and stay invested in there. So that leads us towards software and other, other um, and software and staples and things that are predictable. But generally, Chris, we invest in cash flow predictable cash flows that we think can grow over the medium term and not evaporate. So obviously right now you're seeing that people have paid way forward for future distant cash flows, that even small changes in discount rates and bond yields can have a major effect on the valuation of that equity. So thankfully we're not not involved in any of those stocks. We weren't involved in the way up and we weren't involved in the way down. But I think we are agnostic to this, outside of certain sectors we won't invest in because of poor return on invested capital. We're agnostic to the sector overall. We just look for the best company that we can find and then put it into the portfolio within the, within the parameters of risk we're, uh, we're prepared to take. What are you seeing in the market? You know, we've had an extraordinary year of 12 months or 14 months of COVID uh, that's probably been the most difficult period to actually manage money in, given there's such a, a change mm. around. What are you seeing going forward now for the next 12 months? Do you look at it that far forward? Yeah, absolutely. Look, look, we're trying to, trying to invest over three to five years. So we're thinking about the next 12 months. I mean, really, we've been thinking about inflation and bond yields and corresponding with our investors and changing the portfolio a little bit since about September last year, feeling that the risk of inflationary pressure in the current period in the next three months, as we cycle very low inflation PCP numbers from this period last year, the peak of the pandemic, mm that there will be some high headline inflation numbers and the market might get a little spooked. Also, you've got a lot of bond issuance coming up from governments and there's quite a lot of supply of bonds as well. I think my overarching belief is that interest rates have bottomed. You know, they can't go any lower. There's absolutely, that's, yeah. people should remind themselves of that constantly. They can't go lower. So what does that mean? That you may have seen the peak valuation of profitless companies. It is amazing to me, Chris, that the market in a pandemic and out of a pandemic was led by profitless companies. The best performing companies made no profits and consumed capital. That is not a sustainable uh, situation in my view. Now we're seeing a bit of air come out of those pockets of the market and a bit of rotation to more stable, you know, traditional industrial companies and some commodity stocks. And I think that will probably continue because the pathway of inflation and growth and everything is higher. Bond yields will probably trickle higher, but we need to put this in context. The lowest 10-year bond yield ever in in US 10-year bond yield in history before the pandemic was 1.32%. As I speak to you today, the US 10-year bond yield is 1.56%. It would be considered a colossally low interest rate. (laughs) So it's amazing how the market may well have priced very, very low discount rates and very low bond rates as permanent and has taken, been obviously caught a little bit of, gar- little bit of off guard in the recent, you know, recent times. But we don't invest in profitless companies. So we didn't own Tesla on the way up, much to our you know, annoyance, but we won't own it on the way down either. Sure. We don't own the buy now, pay later, se- pay later sector. And so what, they don't meet our, they simply don't meet our investment criteria of generating cash and barriers to entry, etc. But I think you've probably seen the peak in the price paid for profitless tech companies. I'd be very surprised if they retraced to their highs again. And there's been a lot of people chasing money, a lot of people chasing performance, and I think the air could continue to come out of that. But we hold a pretty balanced portfolio. We have everything from Berkshire Hathaway, through to Microsoft, through to PayPal, through to Coca-Cola, and that is deliberate. We have some companies we think will benefit from a bit of reflation and pricing power, and some like Microsoft, we just think are great long-term investments. And now if they fall a bit, a little bit, they never really went up that much either. So we'll be looking to add to those sort of businesses. But I do think you are absolutely past the low point of interest rates. And that has ramifications for stock selection, portfolio construction, but particularly for profitless tech companies. Sure. So you're quite right, I think, that interest rates can't get any lower. That's fine. But how high can they go? Because even if they double from here, yeah. you know, 1.53 to 3.5%, which would really imbalance or scare the market. What's your view on that? Yeah, look, I think in the shorter term, the next 12 months, I think there probably is a cap on how high bond yields can go and discount rates can go. 
I mean, remember the world is hugely indebted now. You know, even very small moves in bond yields are quite big percentages, quite big capital losses for the bondholder and quite a big you know, interest rate increase for the actual borrower as well. So these are big percentage moves, even though they're small, small absolute moves as such. So look, I think with the actions of central banks, demographics, and probably some of this inflation being transitory, not, not necessarily permanent, the bond yields may in the, in the shorter term peak at around 2% which is hardly a high bond yield of anything, and generally probably not a headwind for the equity market overall, because it's reflective of growth, the world recovering with vaccines, and all of us going back to normal. So I think that's, um, but I do think that central banks will not like bonds getting out of control. It undoes all their work in the, during the pandemic. It upsets all their targeting of, you know, in targeting of full employment and the full, you know, full GDP growth, et cetera. So I think around 2% on the US 10-year bond might be where it peaks out in this current move, which is really not that far from where we are today. So it's just the speed of change, Chris, that gets people. You know, if you bought some software as a service stock on a multiple of a trillion and the bond yield moves from 60 bips to 160 bips, it's a problem. You know, and I think it's the speed of change that's caught the market a little bit here. But I don't believe in sustained long-term high inflation. I don't believe interest rates will ever get back to where you and I you know, experience them in our lifetime. But I do think that they will edge higher from here. And I think that's okay. Higher interest rates that reflect growth and a little bit of inflation are absolutely excellent for equities generally. Sure, so just leaving the markets aside a bit and looking at the economy, uh, you can see positive things ahead for the economy. Um, vaccination, yep. a lot of stimulation uh, should actually improve things all around. A, a lot of cash sitting on household yeah. balance sheets and presumably on profitable companies' balance sheets. Yeah, I think absolutely. Look, I think Australia is the poster child for how the world will look in possibly six to 12 months' time. We forget, Chris, that you know, we're sitting here in Sydney doing this interview. We, this has been the single best place to be on the planet for the last 12 months. I, I have a brother who works in London and he's been locked in his house with his three kids and his dog and his wife and it's been hard all through the winter. We just don't understand how draconian these lockdowns sure. have been globally and the effect that it's had on spending and confidence and everything. So Australia, where we're broadly with the exception of Melbourne, I suppose, been re relatively immune to this. If you go outside today, and I was in the CBD this morning and then at Barangaroo you know, this afternoon, it's, it's normal. It's basically normal. People are going back to work and it, it's a, it's a normalised world. So yes, I am optimistic that the world will recover. I think the vaccines will work. I think the rollouts will work. There may be a bit of a delay on international travel. I don't, don't, have a, I don't see that opening up quickly. But there's incentive for governments to keep us spending in the domestic economy. I mean, there's nothing wrong with keeping us here and making us spend in Queensland or Tasmania. It all goes round, all gets sure. collected in tax and GST. And there's some, there's some good, good outcomes from that. But I believe we're on a pathway to a more normalised world, like the world was in 2019 when we never saw any of this coming. And so a lot of our portfolio tilts towards businesses that would benefit from reopening. Things like Coca-Cola and Heineken and MasterCard and just businesses that generally benefit from a normalisation of the world and activity. But in the Northern Hemisphere, Chris, I genuinely believe it could be like a war ending. It's been that hard. And remember, when wars end, people spend this confidence. Sure. It could be a very big bump in spending. So we've also got pretty good leverage to you know, businesses like Louis Vuitton and things that you know, generate business from sort of celebration, I suppose. But look, I, I think we are on a pathway to a normal world. And if you look outside in Sydney, it's probably what the normal world looks like without international travel for the time being. Sure. So the roaring 20s all over again? Well, think about it. Like we've got basically free money, you know, real interest rates are still negative, even at 1.5% uh, US bond yield. You know, if a cash in the bank's going backwards, in Australia, house prices have started to go up, the share market's doing okay, people are back at work, getting off JobKeeper. Yes, there's a lot of debt in the world, I get all that, but there is reason to believe in a, a better world, you know, and, and GDP growth cycling very low numbers from this time last year. When I was writing strategy as a stockbroker, I mean, confidence is like a virus too. You know, once people get confident, it, it spreads, and people get obviously FOMO and fear of missing out, and all that sort of. And I just feel the second half of this year globally could be quite positive, quite positive as as people just get back to normal. Charlie, terrific to talk to you. Thank you for your insights into the market and your investment strategy. We look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks, Thanks Chris.